Can you see and hear on Salina Media Connection? Can see or can't hear. <laughs> okay, can you see and hear on YouTube Live? No, they've got a post over there and no volume. It says, it's, do you say you can see it? it says yeah, it's no volume. volume. It says it's Okay, let me check with Slant Media Connection. I always wonder how many. YouTube is up and going. YouTube, YouTube is up and going. Okay, the volume's up? Okay. Can you see the live is going? Slant Media is going. Slant Media is going. Okay. Okay, wow. okay three for three. There we go, guys. Okay, <laughs> we'll call the meeting back to order. Um, after our discussion, do we have a motion from the commission? Mayor Hoppick, um, I would move that we ask staff to, I'm sorry. I can barely hear you. Is your mic on? There's a green light. Is this one any better? No. <laughs> I think they can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. Maybe, maybe it's just me. Or I Sorry. can get closer. All right. Mayor Hoppe, I would ask, I would move that we uh, direct staff to review our current contracts and uh, bid awards uh, in an effort to come up with contingency plans in case our financial uh, situation uh, might warrant uh, altering the the uh, the progress of, of any of our current projects. Uh, Commissioner Hodges, second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to direct staff to review current contracts um, at this time. Two, two things. As a yeah. clarification, yeah. we will reach out to lenders as well as vendors right. as right. part of that research. Correct. And Thank then... Uh, want to offer the opportunity for public comment. I don't know that we have any true public on the line. It looks like it's all staff, but just to be safe. So if there's any callers that want to speak, press star nine. I don't see any. Okay. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Okay, that Did we deal with Vance Brothers for um, the actually, microsurfing Actually, we, we kind of talked about how staff can contact them in, in the intervening week, and then we'll report back. Okay. Okay, that leads us to 5.3. Actually, I think we have more we slides. Have more oh, that's slides. right. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Debbie. I, we talked about that before we went into executive session. Tried to cut you off there. So, uh... Debbie Pack, that gets us that gets us through the projects and awards that we have. This the next section of uh, direction that we're seeking from you is how to move forward with our sub CIP uh, vehicles and equipment purchases and building and facility uh, projects. Um, I will note that the vehicles and equipments on this list that have dollar amounts in the bid column are truly bids. We have not accepted those bids. We have them out. Some of them will expire in short order. Um, and I would just open that up if you have any specific questions. There are a couple of items on here that have already been completed, which is um, the purchase of the city van, which is the $20,000 item on the first that's highlighted blue, and the um, rebuild of the undercarriage, that's the uh, highlighted blue item under the solid waste fund. And then, this is Mike's Craig, if I could add, the only other highlighted blue items are four, four patrol vehicles in the police department, the lowest mileage being 148,000, with two of them exceeding 170,000. So, mm. as staff looked at those, the, those are mileages that were concerning. Um, we just didn't feel like we could add another year's worth of usage onto them. Uh, the remainder, um, as much as we don't want to, whether it's um, striker cots for EMS or m mowers that, you know, the Parks Department, I think we discussed in budget previously, is just year after year failed to rise as a priority. And so their, their maintenance, their fleet gets older and older and higher mileage or higher hours. Uh, but in these times, we just feel like we need to defer it one more year. 
Commissioner Franz, I'm not sure we necessarily need to defer for a full year, but certainly mm -hmm. until later right. this yeah. year, we might later look at some of these items depending on what's happening. Because I know that there we have some equipment that's getting pretty aged, you know, it's mm -hmm. probably still functional, but at some point, yeah, that's you, a good can't, point. you cannot continue yeah. not getting stuff. Yeah, Mayor Hobbick, it's, it's, if we, if we don't do something, then we're going to find ourselves in a real problem yeah. down the road. And so, I, yeah. I, th I think you're right. I think we'll we need to but defer it for six months defer, or something well, at like least that. And I don't know that we need yeah. a specific or, time frame. Or if frame, something breaks down, then it we'll, comes to us yeah. and it can't be we'll, repaired. We'll yeah. figure it out throughout the rest of the yeah. year. Um, Commissioner Hodges, I did have a question on item number 121, which was the five-yard single-axle dump truck. Evidently, it's replacing one that was wrecked in 2019, and it's it's a big one. It's $110,000. It was the cost was estimated at 119, and the bid was actually 110, 300 dollars. And I didn't know how critical that is to um, streets functioning. I mean that that is obviously. I mean that's replacing something that's gone. Sure. So that would be one that I would be open to if um, if that's a critical piece of equipment for um, yeah, streets I, to have. I understand your point and if it's okay I can follow up um, after this meeting. I think yeah. we I think we have multiple so it would be a function of uh, functioning with one less, but I'll verify. Would we have an insurance oh, claim? Oh, excuse thing. me, Mayor Hoppe. Would we have an insurance claim pending on that to help replace that? Yes, we would, but I don't know that we have to replace it. So I mean, I don't, I don't know. Well. I'm just asking if there was dollars out there that yeah. would yeah. would uh, soften yeah. that 110,000 caught bid. Yeah, and that was, that was my point. I didn't know if it was the only one they had or, you know, if it's right. one of five, it's a completely right. different conversation. Thank you. This is Debbie Pack. I would, too, mention that the item under uh, utilities at the bottom that's highlighted in green, Ms. Tasker had indicated to me that that was um, needed repairs on the well pumps. Uh, I don't know if she's on the line and she wants to uh, give she, more specifics to that, but that was one that she felt really needed to move forward. Yeah, she is on the line. We carried it forward on her recommendation that it's a necessity. Um, she hasn't indicated. Uh, you want a star nine? <laughs> I don't know. Ask her. I think if you're willing to go forward with it, I don't know that she needs okay. to add anything, okay. but I'll keep an eye out. Then the next page is uh, similar. This is sub-CIP projects that were um, budgeted under the bu uh, buildings and facilities category. Uh, part of these are sales tax, part of them are from utility funds, and part of them are from the solid waste fund. Here again, the yellow ones are the ones that um, we're recommending that we hold. Uh, the one highlighted in blue, which is the fire department generator, uh, we're recommending to move forward. That Half of that is covered by the 911 funds. Mm -hmm. That, yeah. are, that come in through 911. Mike's correct. That, that is a fire department generator, but it, it is our backup location for 911 dispatching. So it's physically located at station number three, but it's a generator for dispatching purposes. Is that same firehouse suffering any structural damage from the plumbing repairs? Uh, that there was the identified need for bathroom plumbing repairs, but no structural damage that I'm aware of. Just. The guys have to live there 24 hours, and guys generically, 24 hours a day. I just want to make sure that they're, well, not only comfortable, but right. safe. Yeah, I, I think the need for repairs may arise, but I don't know that a $10,000 remodel is and necessary at this point. What type of repairs are needed at the crematorium? Um, I believe it's it, the brick lining that kind of contains the heat. Uh, they, over time it cracks and we've had to do that, uh, I can't remember the last time, but we have to do it fairly frequently. And, and frankly, I asked the uh, Parks Department and Animal Shelter to look at what other communities that don't have a crematorium do and look at alternatives that could avoid this cost at this time. Sounds like they're probably bringing them here. But, uh, well, we no longer do that. We, uh, we used to, you know, do cremations, uh, private individual cremations for a fee. We've, we've 
direct, redirected that. So the, our cremations are limited to strays and, and you know animals that we pick up that are injured on the road. Um, they're not uh, pers private, personal pets. Commissioner Hodges, so this, oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Ryan here. Is this is this crematory operational? I thought we were taking animals to another facility. To um, I believe it, our concern is that it will, if it continues to fail, it's not operational. I, I believe it is at this point, but we're concerned that we need to get it repaired to continue to use it. So, you know, the conversation I had with staff was if this do, is not funded and we're not able to cremate anymore, find alternatives. Commissioner Hodges, I, I too had understood it that it had failed and we were um, taking our disposals um, elsewhere and I guess that it's one of those things that you know if we're paying out fifty thousand dollars in terms of transport transport and crematorium fees to mm -hmm. another entity that's fine if it's anything below that you know thirty seven thousand dollar threshold I would agree to keep it on on hold uh, but may you know, Mayor Hoppe, could we could we find out what we're doing with uh, if we're yeah, trans that'd be great if we could find out yeah. we're, where we're transporting them if they could give us an idea of costs like if we have staff that's doing that or if it's volunteers right. so it's, that'd yep. be helpful in that I one. Can one other for you. thing would be if this was fully functional would we then be able to accept referrals uh, <laughs> we from just procedurally places. we stopped doing that it it from a efficiency standpoint and a staffing standpoint it, it was overwhelming um, okay. and especially when you're trying to do separate cremations per um, private cremation well my curiosity when you say it fails what does happen or doesn't happen I, I think it, it, leaves, it loses its insulating value. It, it's kind of lined with clay bricks and lined I think fire they, brick, and it eventually burns up. Yeah, and the floors of them tip, typically are the first things to go. Having some firsthand experience, <laughs> yes. experience. <laughs> but it's basically a large kiln, yeah. and they they burn up. Okay. So is there any other additional information that you'd like us to bring forward with this, or are you willing to give us some direction on these items in general? Commissioner Hodges, I think the ones that I would like more information on would be the crematorium repairs and, um, excuse me, sorry to knock my mic, and um, that one um, single, axle, single dump axle dump truck, if that's, if there's an insurance claim pending and if that's an essential part of the fleet or just a backup. And I'd like to still add that bathroom plumbing and yeah. okay. firehouse three. Agreed. I'm, what, what that it, entails yes. as far as is it, yeah. yeah I agree. When bathroom plumbing goes really bad, I mean, then the whole building is, I won't say useless, but it's no fun to go to work in. Okay, do we have any consensus on moving forward on any of the projects that were discussed? I would, you ready for a motion or is there any more discussion? Uh, we need to probably, Yeah, I, think, I, I, think I was wanting to see if we had any other questions oh. and then we can, yeah. I think Debbie's got a couple more slides that kind of try to sum this up for you to give you a sense of, and uh, if we try to do all this, how much progress that might make for us. And then if you want to give us some direction, we okay. can go from there. Okay. Debbie Pack. Um, so be beyond projects, then we started to look at other opportunities for savings that we thought would would occur be based on the um, environment that we're currently in. Uh, the first thing we looked at was part-time salaries. Obviously, uh, we looked at part-time mowers that could be covered by full-time staff in in parks, uh, Kenwood C Cove, whether that's a partial season or what that looks like. The field house, uh, museum staff that would possibly be able to be covered by full-time staff. And obviously any of the recreational programming that parks is providing. Um, 
when we looked at those numbers, we, we came up with a, a value of about $850,000 in wages that could possibly be saved. And that was through input from the departments um, looking at what their staffing needs they thought they would be in this time of time that we're, we're dealing with now. A majority of those were in parks um, as as well understood with the programming that's going on. Uh, another area we asked hey, that... If I could jump sure. in a sec. Mike's Craig again. Uh, two clarifications. One we've already talked about and that is you know, pulling back staff, uh, Kenwood Cove being the example, this represents the savings, but it doesn't represent lost revenue. Right. And secondly, when we talk about... That's, that's pretty important, actually. Yes. yes. Yeah, um, I agree. And secondly, then, when we talk about covering by full-time staff, that assumes very significant changes in offerings. I mean, everything that the full-time staff is currently doing... Um, uh, mowing it would take priority and so everything from landscaping to you know programming and, and all that we this this is very much an assumption that we need to find all possible measures of cost savings and we need to contract our services to the bare minimum Commissioner Davis to what extent do the part-time employees in the summer fill in for full-time employees when they're on vacation sick uh, or which may be right. a consideration this summer. Uh, I mean, are we going to cut the staff down so low that we can't pull these folks back to work if we need them? Because um, they probably talk about have to find work elsewhere. Staff, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I would expect that if we proceed with uh, notifying them that we're not going to use part-time staff, they probably would try to find a different alternative. Um, as far as covering full-time staff. Um, you know, I, I, without speaking with the department head, it really kind of depends on the scheduling of vacations and they're in the midst of taking the non-essential designations that we just did and saying, all right, given the staffing we have, given uh, the priority of tasks we need to complete, what's a revised schedule look like? Um, and they, this would cause them to do that for the, for the remainder of the season probably if we don't bring part-time on board. I, I wish I could be more specific, but that's about all I can tell you at the moment. Agreed. It just we won't have any really reserve staff then. No. Um, yeah, we we'd be relying fully on full time staff and uh, prioritization by supervisors and department heads to allocate what resources we have. Mayor Hoppaker, and I guess what we're really doing is we're right now we're planning for the worst because we know our our sales tax won't go to zero. We don't know what that's going to be, and property tax. You know there will be some delinquencies, possibly, but you know you still get those at some date. So I think what we do is we're we're cutting, but at some point maybe during the summer if things start to recover, we can you know we can start backfilling some of the projects and some of these purchases that need to be done. So I think what staff's done, and tell me if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, is we've, we're looking at ev cutting everything we possibly can, pretty it, much. It, with the exception of full-time staff. Full-time staff, right. Yep. And so Mike's, Mike's Craig, I'm jumping ahead just a little bit, but you know the last slide totals the, this number, and it, we've tried to be as aggressive as we can. That's about 13% of the general fund budget. And so, you know, if we do everything we're talking about, if we can do everything we're talking about, then we've probably identified 13% savings out of the general fund when we're hearing numbers. Uh, what, what number is 13% of the general fund? Uh, 6 million, Six million. Uh, 44. Yeah, but 4.8 of that is out of the special sales tax yeah, fund. Yeah, you're right. Um, and if yeah, we right. do that, then we're going to, I think, have to take some kind of formal action to redir redirect that money. That's true. Um, and and that means, uh, in my mind, that we will have changed the purposes of that, that money to some extent. So not that we can't do that, but it's something we need to do deliberately. Right. Um, I think the next step is to try to work this stuff we've talked about today, figure out what the net savings on the part-time staff are, mm -hmm. because we we absolutely have to know if it's not 850000 it's probably more like 400000 based on Kenwood Cove alone. Um, you know, we need to know that. Um, and then I think we, at some point, need to take, uh, at some point very soon, need to take a stab at the revenue side and figure out 
what we think is going to happen there. And there is some information out there now in, in terms of economic forecasting that does not paint a very pretty picture. Uh, uh, and I, I've spent the last couple of days looking at that, and I'm very, very concerned that we do have to get into talking about furloughing staff, changing staffing levels, uh, probably to a, a more of a degree than we'd like to think about. Yeah. So I think we need to look at that revenue side next. Well, and I figure and out I, what, how yeah. close we're coming with this, and then we'll know what we're dealing with. And, and, Commissioner, thanks, Craig. I, I agree. Right, and Commissioner Franz is correct that. That six point that six point one million number that we've identified assumes sales tax fund savings, and and it, on my part, it assumes we've said property tax stabilization. This would be a sizable property tax yeah. stabilization right. initiative, but my my broad point is that total is thirteen percent when we're talking, and that thirteen percent will reduce if there's offsetting revenue impacts, and we're talking. You know, we don't yeah. just to give you some perspective in terms of. Uh, how much progress that looks like relative to an unknown impact, but we're seeing 25% to 33% projections by some. 40% um, by yeah. some. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and most that's of a these, big hit on sales tax. Most of these part-time employees, are they currently employed or these would be summer yeah, hires? Seasonal. Uh, so they've not been hired right. yet. Yeah. Right. We, we have some okay. that you know return year after year yeah. and we'd have right. to uh, from an accounting standpoint, we have to look at their status on the books. But these would these are positions that have yet to report for duty, essentially. And I and I don't know if this is the appropriate time. I know you handed us out uh, some information on what some other communities have mm -hmm. done for personnel, and uh, uh, I know that I th I know that staff is reviewing the. Uh, stimulus package to see how that would uh, impact, you know, uh, employees if if they were furloughed, and I think we're still trying to get a handle on that. Right. Uh, if yeah. I'm if I'm correct, because there's part of what I understand on that stimulus program is it's to help keep the the employee as close to whole as possible, and so I think yeah. we we have some more research to do on that at this time. And I'm prepared to give a little bit more detail when yeah. we get to the that staff report. Right. The reason I jumped to the end a little bit is I, I completely understand angst and, and reservation for cutting individual projects. But I was just trying to give you kind of that bigger picture perspective of as aggressive as this might feel, I, I, it isn't, I can't guarantee it's an overcorrection. Mm -hmm. I, I, it may not be enough. Right. Agreed. Commissioner Hodges, and, and with that being said, I was just um, looking at the federal funds exchange available for uh, 2020. Was that something? I, I just wanted to make sure I'm not. I don't think I understand that um, that slide because I, I or. I think that means they would use part of those funds, that 897, to right. do those two projects, which mm -hmm. would leave us a balance, a balance of 637, of 637. 688. Okay. Those were the lot. couple that were originally recommended. Right. I think there may be one more that we added to that list that we might have recommended to use those funds for. And remember, those funds have to be used for streets, for streets right. this year in 2020. Can any so if we select a project that's a street-related project, we could certainly uh, put those under that federal fund was exchange the dollar. Mulberry, Commissioner Hodges, was, was the Mulberry um, mm -hmm. sewer project also identified to, and that was a big one, that was like a 4, 459, yeah. Yeah. 460? That might Correct. have been the other one. Mul Mulberry storm sewer. Yes. Uh, storm I could, sewer. Yep. I didn't catch if you said sewer or storm sewer, but uh, yeah, and, and storm and sewer, I mean, which said, is yeah. a street project. So that would, that would come off of... Um, and I, that, I think that's what I was getting at. So that would be another 460 off of that. Right. So then we'd be looking at 200 and some. But yeah, my, we certainly want to identify enough projects to utilize that funding. That's right. basically. Well, Mike's Craig again. Back on slide 19, my notes were to itemize projects and report back to you uh, options and a prioritization relative to the that $897,000 balance to be spent. But yeah, the crack ceiling. Mulberry, Santa Fe, we're all in that, that discussion. Yeah. Commissioner Franz, my only concern about the Mulberry storm sewer 
<coughs> is it's kind of, if you're doing the storm sewer by itself, it might be on the edge of what they consider to be something suitable for that particular pot of right. money. Yeah, now, I, if I you were doing the street and you're doing the storm sewer as a part of the street project, you normally would be able to to do the whole thing, but if you're just focusing on the storm sewer, eh, you know they might be okay with it or might not. I'm just saying we need, I think, some clarification on that. I'll there, verify, but I believe that the 450 number is street and storm. Okay. We technically are working on the street as well, but for no other reason than to you know, re I, repair I, the damage from the construction. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I do not know that. I just remember when I asked about where the storm sewer was, they said it ran beside the street, not underneath the street. So my presumption mm -hmm. is is that you could replace the storm sewer without necessarily tearing up the street, but the street does need work also. So mm -hmm. uh, I guess we just need to know what the scope of that project is, and if we're going to do the street, I have no issues. I may not have issues anyway if the, it's an okay use of that money. I just think we need to be careful. Sure. Are there any callers that wish to make any comments there? Mike? I'll update the screen. If there's any callers that wish to comment, please press star 9. I know every one of them, and okay. I don't see any of them asking okay. to comment. Okay. Do we need some action from the commission on how to proceed with the sub-CIP projects that were brought to us? Well, I'm thinking if I understand the gist of our conversation, we were in agreement with the department head's suggestions with the request that we get additional information on, I'll have to look at the list on just a few items. It was the, uh, lost the page. I know one of them was the plumbing, plumbing, right. the dump truck and the dump crematorium. And the crematorium, yeah. There were, were there were some other items there that were, as far as the patrol cars, the, um, I think the rebuild of the undercarriage and the city van have already taken place, but we also had the well pumps. Mm -hmm. and the well that, pump. And well, I don't. But that was a recommendation that it be. Right, and that's what spent, I, we yeah. need to probably give staff direction to proceed with oh, those I've, purchases if we're going to do right, those. Right, that's yeah. the reason I said I would just agree with the department head's suggestion, unless you need a more specific well, it's it's if you can give us general direction, Let's, we'll bring you an action item back okay. and That'll itemize it. And if you, by those. amendment, okay. you could modify a little bit, okay. you know, project by project here or there. But if this is generally in keeping with your vision of the extent of our budget efforts and our expenditure avoidance, we'll we'll frame this up as a okay. formal action item for you to. Do you need a motion to, to move forward on that, or just direction? Uh, I, I think time? I have enough direction, direction. from you that I, okay. I, I think I think we can now draft something that okay. you know isn't going to have to be massively amended by you at, from the dais and okay. and bring it back to you okay. for action. Okay. Okay. Are we done with five point two, Debbie? I don't want to cut you off again. <laughs> I think we're okay. Okay, with that, we will move to 5.3 additional temporary COVID-19 related personnel manual updates. Okay. The public will excuse us for a second. We're trading out staff again. Debbie left the room, but I, I want to be sure to thank Debbie Pack, you, Tara man. Sauber, our Deputy Finance Director, Natalie Fisher, uh, HR Director Scott Gardner, who put in quite a bit of time, and then all the department heads and their support staff. I, in all honesty, we were here, I guess, Saturday afternoon, and that was the first opportunity I got to see uh, what the department heads offered up in terms of contractual services, and I, I was frankly pleasantly uh, Overwhelmed, I think is a way of put it in my email to them. The first pass, they they understood it. They they made some very hard recommendations. Um, 
you know, as, as we well know, 70% of our budget is as personnel, and we haven't tackled that. But we tried to make a real detailed and, and aggressive pass through the budget, and I appreciate everybody's efforts to support that. So with that, Natalie Fisher is here as the HR director. Uh, did do you see Greg? Is he coming? Okay, I'm, I'll go ahead and get started on uh, the personnel matter that we have before you. So la we, I, I left last week thinking we were uh, leading the curve in terms of getting on top of the Families First uh, Coronavirus Response Act and getting you an action item and felt pretty good about that uh, and still do. I mean, we, we, we were pretty aggressive about that. There was one assumption that we made that is starting to come to light, and I, I should tell you the Department of Labor has until tomorrow, no, day after tomorrow, before they have to put out guidance, and here we are still trying to uh, make some decisions on behalf of our employees as they're under a stay-at-home order. So we have a sense of urgency, and the Department of Labor's timeline doesn't necessarily sync up. Um, but having said that, and there we've, we've seen conflicting information about whether a stay-at-home order uh, rises to the level of the emergency paid sick leave that the Families First Act provides for. And um, I, I, we've had real great conversations with the county, the county administrator and the health direct, department director. And so I kept saying, we need to be sure to get that synchronized. And, and, they finally un they set me straight that well, they, their intention was not to rise to the level of a quarantine or isolation order as the, the act describes because that that means something even more restrictive than what we're under right now. And so we're still waiting to see what, what the intention of the act is, but that at least calls into question um, the assumption that we had last week that our employees would have 80 hours of paid leave through the emergency paid sick leave provision to the Family First Act. That causes us then, and then we have the implementation of the Safer at Home Directive from Saline County that has been superseded by Governor Kelly's executive order. So that just heightens the fact that we have employees now that we've um, designated non-essential, and I should tell you, um, our approach to non-essential and essential, we, again, tried to make an aggressive pass through our organization identifying non-essential employees because I, I want to give them the opportunity to stay home and not be exposed if at all possible. Uh, that's my number one priority. So then we've got timing issues. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've got timing issues of we may have to call some back um, when we've tried to designate you may be non-essential, but we may need you to work from home. We may need you to be on call. And as we, I really didn't know what the phones were going to do today. I, I frankly expected just to be inundated with phone calls, and it was surprisingly quiet. But we're going to have to size up the workload, and we may have to take some non-essential employees and, and ask them to come work, you know, a partial schedule and a and split schedule. So all that then factors into uh, they potentially are going to have some time that they're not scheduled that we need to try to address that, won't, that we initially thought would be emergency paid sick leave that was compensable. So boiling all that down, um, and Greg's put in a lot of work as well right up to this meeting, um, we've tried to prepare, well, we've identified a couple of options. Um, we as an organization could, and I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but we could create COVID-19 related paid leave and allocate a block of time that is a leave available possibly through the remainder of this year for COVID-19 related absences, whether that's because we didn't schedule them because of a safer at home order. They had to be quarantined because of travel. They had to be quarantined because of exposure, symptoms, um, child, uh, the child care factors in there as well. So one possibility is you could, you could create a new bank of paid leave of some sort. The other possibility is we <coughs> could extend, <coughs> excuse me, we could extend um, the uh, amount of um, leave advancement that we'd make available to employees. If you assume a month, that's essentially 160 hours of when well, we set aside 110. Um, and you could do anything in between. You could you could do full 160 hours of paid leave or you um, could leave it the way it is. We tried to provide you with a little bit of a summary of what we're seeing other communities do. Um, again, this is moving so fast that um, it's hard to get gather 
current or final information. The, the reason we did not provide individual cities is a lot of this was just responses on an email listserv to, to Ms. Fisher, and it was uh, best guesses on the part of HR directors at the time the question was asked and formal action would need to be taken yet. Um, the things that we do know, I uh, attached a couple of articles to the staff report, one being um, the Douglas County leader's approach to providing approved paid leave, and then uh, there's an article about Wichita and uh, their approach to furloughing employees, and, and they also have some very detailed provisions about uh, people putting leave into a bank to be allocated to others and people donating leave to other employees. And, and some communities have had that all along. That's not something the city of Salina has ever done. Um, the other thing I would tell you is the stimulus bill passed on Friday. It was signed on Friday afternoon. So we've tried to take a look at that, but there's a lot of detail there, and I don't claim to have had an opportunity to review that in, in full detail. Um, it appears that... You know, it intends to provide unemployment benefits, f federal funding for unemployment benefits. And as I understand it, and I hesitate to say this because I'm working off of generalities and news broadcasts and, and email blips, but um, it offers up $600 a week of additional benefit beyond uh, the, the benefit you might otherwise receive uh, for unemployment for whatever state you're in. Um, so, and then it extends it to a 39-week period. So one of the things we tried to do is do a calculation of, based on a salary level, what would your typical benefit be from uh, the state of Kansas? And it's 4.25% of your average quarter of the, f uh, the oldest four quarters of the last five. And so, it, 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 but I think we could, if we could verify a little bit more detail, you have that benefit plus the $600 benefit, and there's been some conversation that unemployment could leave people whole, if not even leave some ahead. So I think there's a way to, to get more detail and calculate exactly what that might look like for our employees and what their alternatives might be. Uh, looks like the stimulus bill and unemployment in general provide for, you know, if you've, your schedule is, is cut and you've got a loss in pay, trying to pay unemployment for that, that lost income. You don't have to be fully unemployed, possibly. Um, and then the furlough uh, provisions. And so one of the, th you know, th some of the details there that we've talked about, but we probably need more detail are um, if employees have leave uh, accrued with us and they're furloughed, are they able to draw unemployment and then return and pick up the, where they left off with their leave? And then what becomes of their, their health benefit, insurance? benefits. Um, I, as much as I'd like to have all that for you today and say, here's the plan, uh, I think we're, we need some more dust to settle in terms of the, the stimulus and how it's going to be implemented. I was on a Kansas Department of Emergency Management call on Sunday and posed the question of, is there guidance uh, available yet or is it forthcoming as it relates to Kansas unemployment? the stimulus bill and how it supplements Kansas uh, unemployment, the response was, we're working on it. It's forthcoming, uh, maybe, th maybe this week. So getting back to kind of what we did last week and what's before you today, uh, our intention is to try to, to address the fact that it does not appear that the emergency paid sick leave will be applicable to either order, the county safer at home order or the governor's stay at home order. And so some of the assumptions that I provided you last week to say, well, let's do 110 hours of advance leave to supplement the emergency paid sick leave aren't, don't apply. And so it, boiling it down, um, it appears to me that your options would be to, supplement, to replace that 80 hours of paid leave uh, that we thought was going to be required by the act with creating a new bank of leave or uh, if you don't want to create a paid bank of leave then ex increasing the amount of leave advancement that you, we would allow to at least allow an employee if on the assumption they have no leave on the books at all um, enough adv leave advancement to cover the 30-day stay-at-home order um, we've talked previously that it doesn't, you know, this isn't an added expense. If you created the, the 80 hours of paid leave, that's not a new budgeted expenditure above and beyond our payroll. It would just be 
the opportunity for an employee to n not be working and be compensated in lieu of comp being compensated for time work. Now, on the tail end, um, they are you know they'd be able to use their that would help them preserve their vacation and their sick leave. They would be able to use their vacation uh, at some future date. We do allow them to cash in vacation, so you know they they could cash in some of that. And it would also help them preserve their sick leave, which they could use at a future date. And we currently, um, if a, an employee leaves in good standing, we compensate them at one third of their uh, value of their sick leave. So there is some cash cost on the back end, but there's no direct added expense in the 2020 budget. So I significantly went off script there in terms of the staff report, but I think that is uh, that covers the waterfront in terms of what we thought we knew last week, what we know now, what your alternatives are. Uh, Mr. Bankson, has, I believe, has tried to prepare a resolution that um, starts with the presumption of 80 hours of paid leave and 120 hours of leave advancement. So that creates another week. If, if an employee is truly off a week and then has other COVID-19 related absences, it creates an additional 40 hours available to them. Um, and then uh, we can amend that, that language as you might want to give us guidance. So I'd be happy to stop there, try to answer questions, and then distribute the resolution and walk you through it. Commissioner Davis, is the emergency paid sick leave something that can be interrupted? Uh, you take 40 hours, either come back because you, know, you need them for a week, or God right. forbid they get an appendicitis right. and they use right. their real sick leave well, that, for that, a, and then can they come back and get those other three weeks of... Uh, Mike Scrigg, that's a really good question that we've been asking ourselves. If you recall, one of the, the slides in the PowerPoint I presented last week right. was a direct quote because we couldn't figure it. We, it was so up in the air to us that we just didn't feel like it was clear and it was on that very topic right um, and so hopefully we'll have Department of Labor guidance in a day or two that might shed some light on that question yeah Natalie Fisher director of human resources the Department of Labor has provided some very basic guidance in the form of uh, question and answers and they did address the intermittent aspect and it does appear as long as the employer is willing to be able to accommodate that that it would be it could be intermittent that it would not have to be um, 80 successive um, working hours but the full regs have still yet to be published okay. tentatively it does look like it okay, so that's promising but and I apologize that I'm repeating myself the that is available if you have a medical if you if you're individually self quarantined by a medical provider if you are have symptoms and you're seeking medical diagnosis if you qualify for the school um, child care issues but emergency paid sick leave is not available for our non essential employees that are not working as a result of this stay at home order. Really, Mayor Hoppinger, yeah. I, I, I still feel like I'm missing information <laughs> because we we don't know how the stimulus package comes down. I mean, are we going to be back here next week yeah. making a change because we've now found out how that product or how that is going to affect our employees? We could. Uh, the reason I brought it to you today is out of concern for our employees who right. are caught in limbo wanting to know you know what what their status is now having said that the the 110 hours of leave advancement that you provided last week was intended to supplement emergency paid sick leave so i've taken the approach that you can supplement zero <laughs> if, if there is no paid uh, emergency paid sick leave then our intent our stated intent in the resolution was very clearly to try to supplement their their income with leave advancement but if they truly are impacted a full month without any other leave on the books 110 hours of leave advancement won't be enough for that individual employee um, commissioner hodges here uh, as i said last week i find the whole leave advancement to be um, really problematic and cumbersome for staff to administer and as i look to you know 
some of the, the options that other communities are doing. I guess my question is, why can't we um, do full pay through April 30th so that we do have um, the, you know, we can see some of the ramifications of what's going to go into effect on April 1st from the Department of Labor and we'll have time then to respond to that. And then, I mean, you know, maybe the um, non-essential workers don't continue to accumulate, you know, vacation or leave time, or even, even if they do. But I would just rather, we, we're going to go ahead and we're going to commit to paying you through a certain date, whether you're here or whether you're not. Um, and we're, we're going to afford you as much flexibility as we can in terms of, like we talked about earlier, putting people on different shifts, working from home. But I mean, I think that something like that would demonstrate that, you know, we want to do right by the employees. And in terms, then in turn, I think that they would be more inclined to be like, okay, this week I'm non-essential, but it turns out I'm needed, so I'm essential, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be called back, and I'm going to be um, working. And maybe that's an overly simplistic view, and but that's just kind of my perspective to get us through this initial, um, you know, this time of uncertainty in terms of seeing how the federal programs play out. And then a question I have is, how is the county handling their um, this dilemma. I tried to catch an employee mm -hmm. earlier on my way in and, and he wasn't able to give me a lot of specifics. So I didn't know how, how does what we're proposing with like leave advancement and all, all right. of this other stuff, how does that align with the with what the county's doing? Uh, I'll try to take them in order a little bit. I, yeah. y your initial question is can we and, and I think you can. If you as a governing body say you, you know, you're inclined to just uh, create yeah. paid leave. Hey, there's one thing that you said there that, and they may not accrue leave later. From a from a vesting standpoint, and from a you know a defer in conferring of rights, if we're going to do that, we have to. We it all do, has to be decided. Sure, on the that's front and end. that's fine. Um, I you know and, and that you know that's yeah that's that, cool. Uh, and so if that's the case, that that's kind of another way to say leave advancement, really. Um, because if we're if we're committing to paying them now, and we just won't accrue vacation and sick leave later, that's essentially leave advancement. Um, but I don't, Commissioner Hodges. But I don't want people like you know. Let's say I I've only accrued like two days of leave, and I'm sick. My kid's home from school. Um, I end up taking up two months, taking out two months. I mean, I kind of feel like then we're putting people in the position of they're going to be working off that working to gain that time for years before they even get back to being even. I mean, am I interpreting that correctly? I mean, well, am I understanding the leave advancement? I mean, so somebody yeah. who, who has to bank that leave ad advancement ahead could be in a position where they're not going to have any flexibility whatsoever to be sick, to care for somebody who's sick. Yeah. And also what happens then if they go ahead and they separate from us before they've repaid all their leave advancement. I mean, we're not going to, I'm assuming that we're not going to, you know, hold them responsible for, you know, paying us back for, for leave that we advanced. I just think that we should make it as, as, as simple as possible. And if we want to, whatever we want to call it, just get people paid through the end of the month and don't penalize them when we're in a very uncertain time. Yeah, and, and that, we would still, though, have to follow the federal regulation. We would still have to give them the emergency yeah, if they qualify. after that April 30th. They, well, they would have no reason to use it before April 30th then. I, mm -hmm. And, and yeah. I think that at least if we put like a timeline, like a month timeline on it, then we can maybe respond and come up with a policy that's going to be able to stand for longer than you know, a week or two until we learn more. Well, you know, let the dust settle a mm -hmm. little bit in terms of what. Because we'd, we'd be out. obligated to give them the, was it 80 hours of EPSL? Mm -hmm. Correct. And that would, I'm assuming that responsibility would not go away just because we kept everybody whole for the month of April. I, yeah, I don't believe that it You're would. Um, the, you'd still have to meet one of those six criteria, criteria to be right. eligible for it. 
Hey, and just uh, you said something which I guess caught me by surprise, but it it, it makes sense with what we heard. Someone who is at home now because they are a non-essential mm -hmm. employee. Currently, right now, under the system we have today, are they getting paid? It's if they had no leave. We, we have 110 hours of leave so that, advancement that we authorized last week. Right. So that, that would if be, they have no other leave, that would be where we would be. It. That's what we'd offer to them. Okay. Natalie Fisher, it would be upon their request. <coughs> so they could opt not to request that advancement and essentially be unpaid. And we could not had apply for unemployment and as long as they were receiving that money there, right? I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, the advance. Could a person apply for unemployment while they were getting those 110 hours? Mm. In normal times, no. no that's With what I thought. all okay. of the new changes, I haven't read anything that makes me believe they would still qualify, but I guess we'll know more soon. Mm -hmm. If I can double back to a couple of other, um, Mike Scrag. Um, so, why shouldn't we do that? We've we've identified approximately 150 non-essential employees, and I expect a good number of that 150 are going to be asked to you know, return in in some less than full-time capacity, or we'll try to work out a schedule. So we have 300 essential employees, and so I, I don't have a, you know a simple answer, but uh, from an equity standpoint, there. The the question you know there is an expectation of equity between the two, and you know if we really want to be generous, then we would extend a month's worth of leave to the essential employees after we get past this issue, and so trying to balance, you know we we have a lot of people that as much as they'd like to be on leave they just don't have a choice and they're working through this, and understandably we have employees that didn't choose to be impacted by a stay-at-home order either but try, trying to find an equitable solution. So I think Mayor Hoppick, if, if they're stay at, asked, if they're not essential and asked to stay at home, is that considered being furloughed? Or is that, uh, what's, what's the term we're using for right. stay at home? Natalie Fisher, um, that's a good question. I was looking for a specific definition of furlough today. <laughs> um, and I haven't been able to do a lot of research, but the one explanation that I found was an employee that is furloughed receives zero um, paid leave, it is unpaid for a period of time without access to the leave benefits um, other than potentially having health insurance paid. Okay, if, if we were to s today agree to 80 hours of paid time off for those that are not essential that would basically be two weeks and we had a chance to study the or at least to try to understand the 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 stimulus package and how that unemployment works and if it was beneficial that we could somehow keep them whole but save the taxpayer dollars. I mean, the city taxpayer, although we're going to be paying for it at the federal level, but you see, what I'm mm -hmm. getting at is that we could help our local budget because we can't print money like the federal government can. If we found out that that wasn't going to be beneficial to the employees, could we then do something after that 80 hours? I believe we could, Mike Scrag, I believe we could. Um, I think. As we find out more about the stimulus bill and unemployment and furlough, we even if we have the 80 hours of paid leave, we still might be able to furlough employees if we think they'll be whole on the unemployment yeah, cause, side. And I'm not sure how that all works because I've heard various things as I try to watch you know, the news and, and I don't think anybody's seen the exact, or at least had the document in front of them, but I was under the impression that if somebody was just cut hours that the stimulus package was to bring them back up to being fully compensated. That's the way I understood and so it as well. I trying to go out a month, I may I feel like maybe we're we're penalizing ourselves. 
and I don't want to penalize the 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 employee, but I want to do it in an equitable fashion to the to the to the city. Does that make any sense? And am I being too simplistic? <laughs> I don't know that that's simplistic well, no, no, uh, like, because well, there's and there's a lot of variables there yeah. that we're trying. But it gives to us balance, two weeks but, to figure out right. what's happening because right. right now we're making a decision not not knowing what all's in our basket to use is the way I feel. Commissioner Franz, I I have I I guess I'm struggling to get my head around all this uh, as I think we all are. Yeah. Um, I have a little bit of a concern about equity. I mean, if you've got employee A that you sent home because they're not essential, and they're at home uh, maybe housebound because of the order, uh, you got employee B who's here and works works 80 hours, they get paid the same. Does the guy, the person who stayed here for the 80 hours and worked, get an extra 80 hours of leave to... Right. I've yet to be asked uh, it, that it, question, but yeah, I will be. To, I'm I'm sure you will, especially since I brought it up. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I struggle with the equity of doing that, and that's one of the reasons why I kind of disagree with Commissioner Hodges about the leave advancement. At least that provides some, uh, some level of equity between those two classes of employees. The employees have to work here has their normal leave they can take, the employee who got time off then is at least responsible for um, uh, for a part of that anyway. Now, there, I understand there are pitfalls in doing that too if they decide to leave before they've paid us back. Well, they, they, they kind of, you know, they, they don't have to pay us back is my understanding. The other qu question I have is I don't understand the discussion about the stimulus bill, maybe because I don't understand exactly what it is that it's doing. Um, is it simply extending unemployment benefits for a period of time? Or is it providing assistance to us to, or to employees who are, as you mentioned, may be employed part-time or may have been sent home temporarily? Um, you know, I thought that's what the emergency leave bill did that we apparently don't qualify for for someone that we've identified as non-essential. I, you know, I, I you know, Mayor Hobby, that's my question. I'm not I, sure what. So, uh, you know, Mike, yeah. Mike's Craig, uh, there's about five questions I'd like to try to address. Yes. Uh, back to Commissioner Hodges. Um, in the event of leaving with a le advanced leave balance. Employees currently enter into an agreement where their their final payment can be withheld uh, for whatever the you know the value. So we may still have exposure. It may be a two week paycheck and a four week balance, but they're currently they enter into an agreement where that can be withheld. Um, uh, and excuse me, Commissioner Hodges. I agree, but I think at least in my mind. It creates an indentured servitude kind of attitude. I, I'm just trying to answer your I question. Know, I, I know. In so terms I, of how it I, works. I mean, yeah. Um, so, Mayor Hoppick, you, you made a comment about the 80 hours of paid leave being available to those staying at home. It, in this format, it would be available to anyone that was impacted by a COVID-19, had reason for a COVID-19 related absence. So that could be an EMS responder that is exposed and, and has to draw sick leave or, you know, has to be away. So in answer to your questions, and I, I don't claim to have, you know, absolute knowledge about all this, but my understanding is that the federal stimulus provides $600 a week of additional funding above and beyond what would the normal benefit would be in what in each state. So each state has a different approach. So but the federal so government so, puts so $600 on top of that. So it applies if an employee is laid off or maybe Correct. furloughed, depending Correct. on what the rules are. If they draw on employment through the state okay. system, then there's an additional 600 okay. And then it also extends the, um, it extends the unemployment period by 13 weeks. And a lot of states are 26, and Kansas is one of them. So it makes it from 26 to 39 weeks. Okay. So, so, Mayor Hobby, so that's what I was getting at is that with the stimulus package, if someone applies for unemployment with the, with the dollars available from the stimulus, they might be made whole. Okay, Commissioner Franz, I, I get that, but if we don't have money 
enough funds in the bank, rolling to the bank, to pay all of our employees and we have to furlough them, whether or not the stimulus package is there is irrelevant to us. It makes them whole and it's a benefit for them and it might make our decision a little more palatable knowing that. But if we don't have money to pay them, we don't have money to pay them. Yeah. Whether or not there's a stimulus package there. Now, if the stimulus package flowed to us to help keep us whole and retain those employees, I can kind of follow the logic. Yeah. Mike Craig, Commissioner Friends is right. All of this it presumes, you know, we've, we just had a financial discussion about what are the likely impacts going to be and, and w whether it is going to impact personnel long term. All of this assumes that there is sufficient finances to continue to pay our, our employees. Now, it, it didn't come up in the budget conversation, but you know, I, I think what we're talking about in the way of expenditure cuts is a first pass at getting our uh, spending un reduced, and then we can see what the next few months bring. Um, we also have reserves that we can draw on, and so are we at risk of not you know, making payroll in the next month 60 90 days no but do uh, i don't think so but 90 days could we, we might be getting close could we have to be thinking about you know long term implications yeah so what do we do at the end of the 30 day period if you're talking about doing this for 30 days and they extend the stay at home order yeah, um, I know. I, I <laughs> because that's, in my judgment, is very likely. In 30 days, according to Dr. Norman, we'll just be getting to the peak of the excitement. Hopefully that'll be a lower peak than might be otherwise possible, but, you know, and then it might be another 60 to 90 to 120 days six months before we're to a point where we can return to normal. So, uh, answering <laughs> one more of Commissioner Hodge's questions, um, uh, the county will be taking it up tomorrow. Okay. Have you, uh, Commissioner Hodges, have you <coughs> spoken to um, Mr. Smith-Haynes or to uh, Ms. Stambaugh about what their proposed approach is going to be, or is it one of the answers that was included um, in your list of responses here? Um, my understanding is that what the county commission is considering is employees who are directed not to report to their normal places of work will be compensated with pandemic pay for up to 25 regular work shifts in a calendar year. What, so do we have a sense of what pandemic pay is? Is that full, full wages? Uh, yeah, I don't. Is I that their so, term? I don't know. Yes. Commissioner Franz, I'm yes. sorry. Is that I'm their sorry. term? Yes. So that is 25 days, so it'd be five weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Over a calendar 200 year. 200 hours. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as long Mayor as they're there. And again, we're trying to weigh budget personnel. <laughs> you know, we've got things here we're trying to weigh. weigh. And you're talking about the county. The county's budget will not be impacted nearly as significant as ours because of the the dollars, the way they take their dollars in. Correct. Uh, the correct. Okay. They, they they receive sales tax as well, but, but they distribute quite a bit of that to other taxing entities. Um, you know, they don't have a lot of debt, right. and I, I understand they they have a reserve, a sizable reserve. Relative, as a percentage of their budget yeah. compared to us. Commissioner Franz well, may, might make a comment. The sales tax is a portion of their budget is like this that's, and ours right. is like That's this. what I was right. getting at. The is that they're not going to be, be impacted like we be are. Be much more stable yeah. so they struggle more in good times because that extra money is not coming in and mm -hmm. when we face times like this they have a little bit more of a stable of a foundation than city does mayor hoppick here I, I guess commissioner franz one of the things you know you were talking about equitable you know and and i understand where you're coming from but would you be okay with a 80 hour emergency paid sick leave until we figure out exactly what's going on i mean i your concern is we can't go you have a problem with this going four months or whatever, paying those that are not 
at work the same as those that are at work. Is that what I was interpreting? Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I just know that when you treat people differently, no matter what the circumstances are, eventually that does wear on I understand. the person who thinks they've been mm -hmm. uh, treated less than fairly. Uh, and I probably don't have a problem with doing it for a very short period of time. But as I said, I'm more inclined to support the advancement than just just pay. Um, you know, uh, but I won't stand in the way of if everybody else feels that we need to extend 80 hours, you know, I'm not going to, you know. And, and is that interruptible? I mean, if someone gets called back to work, yeah, my, my vision, and I think the way that we've prepared it, is it's not just the employee that's subject to the stay-at-home order. It's available for essential employees that are working but have COVID-19-related absences otherwise. So it's a block of 80 hours through the end of the year. Um, and if you're a stay-at-home employee, you, you would need to tap into it sooner. So that employee would have to be directly impacted by COVID to have a reason to use that leaf. Yeah. We're Whereas true. the one staying at home is using it just because well, there's no job for uh, him. Our, our approach is trying to pick up yeah. the, the employee that's been told to stay at home because of COVID-19 in that 80 hours where the family's first act did not. So I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, the eligible uses of, of that 80 hours would be the six criteria that are in the family's first act, as well as yeah. staying home um, as directed. So if you're, I'm repeating myself, but if you're an essential employee, while well, you may not need that leave because you're reporting to work, if you need it for any of the other reasons, symptoms, medical treatment, care for a family member, um, uh, one, one of the issues that I think comes into play is the you've been exposed you're not symptomatic you've been exposed where we need some time to assess your exposure if, if you're essential and you work the whole way through and you know two years later everything is good you never had to use it do those 80 hours have any cash value the way we're approaching it would be COVID-19 related for this year so it's not true vacation time that you could Use cash at in. your leisure, and you couldn't cash it in when you retire. Right, right. Because yeah, the, the big problem, you know, with with the stimulus bill is that it assumes employers have deep pockets. Yeah, and, to, and, to and carry, assumes, carry and get reimbursed. Right, and it yes. assumes employers, like city governments and hospitals, have a conscience, and that you know we would want to do the right thing, but that's only because we may have the ability to do the right thing for a while. But you know, a small smaller business, I mean, unfortunately, in a catastrophe like this, the business shuts down and the employees don't have a job. I mean, it's just everybody's up the creek. Uh, right. you know, so it's, it's it, 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 you know, when you're employer as opposed to employee, you, you know, this thing has two very different different sides. And, and uh, you know, when I leave here and I'm an employee, and I'm sitting up here and I'm an employer and I'm saying, boy, which would I? Which would be more valuable to me? You know, it's. it's uh, I know which is easier. Which is sometimes. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> it's almost uh, as bad as Medicare Part D, but yeah. we won't go there. <laughs> but, <laughs> thanks, Greg. If I may, um, I think last week our intention was to assure our employees that if a stay-at-home order was in place, <clears throat> they had options to cover a full 30 days of not working, and our intention was. It, our assumption was emergency paid sick leave through the Families First Act supplemented with, with leave advancement. The reason I'm back to you is without some additional action, I, I don't think our employees have that 30 days covered. So to me, especially now that we are find ourselves in that order, uh, that to me is probably the, the biggest priority is at least making a, a decision and being able to communicate the employees their status. Um, so that, if you do 80 hours of paid leave, that would just that would take another 80 hours of leave advancement. We stated 120 previously. Um, 
And so, you know, you, you could sort out those numbers as you see fit. Is it, is it like, Commissioner David, is it likely we would find out sufficient information after going through the stimulus bill and all the state and federal statutes between now and two weeks that would be to our advantage to retain flexibility in doing 80 hours now, knowing in two weeks we may have to do another 80, as opposed to doing 160 up front? Well, if the, if the second 80 is leave advancement for COVID-19 related reasons and the federal stimulus imposes on us additional leave there, there, I'm thinking off the top of my head, but there probably wouldn't be a need or a basis to use that additional COVID-19 leave advancement. You'd, you'd, if something else takes priority, they'd use that first. Um, Particularly if it's full paycheck. Right. Now, with respect to furlough, I think we, we definitely intend to gather more information there and if it becomes economically necessary for us as an employer or we think that it's not harmful to the employees, if, if you make a furlough decision, um, then I think that probably takes priority over it. You'd, ha you'd have the ability to do that as a decision in the future. But, but um, as an employee, if I'm caring for kids, that, you know, if I'm furloughed, that tells me, okay, uh, I may have 80 hours of some type of leave, but I need to start looking for another job. Because at the end of the day, I got to bring money home to paying kids well, and pay the bills. If you so, end up in a scenario where you're furloughed and unemployment um, leaves you whole, unemployment, that's true. then, yeah. you know, you're furloughed for a block of time. And, and if we are able to recover and and you know, go back to our staffing levels, you have an opportunity to come back to us. Forgot about the unemployment, so that would. But that, I need to acknowledge the if there. Yeah. Um, Mayor Hoppick, I'm looking at Ms. Fisher. Do you have any idea <laughs> of when anything will be out that we'll be able to get our <clears throat> hands on and kind of get an understanding of? Yeah, Natalie Fisher, the bill required the Department of Labor to provide, I can't remember if they specifically said regulations or just guidance um, by the first. Now, depending upon how many additional question and answer um, bulletins they provide beyond that, depending on how vague they are, that is yet to be determined. Um, I was looking today multiple times on the website just in case they were published and I had, unfortunately didn't find them. I've made a lot of interpretations and assertions. I'd like to give the legal counsel the opportunity to clarify or... So some, someone on Pennsylvania Avenue is going to be up late tonight getting all this work done. <laughs> <laughs> well, as uh, Ms. Fisher has referred to, the uh, Q&A came out. I know the league had updated their material based on that information. Uh, I had not had an opportunity to go through the Q&A that the Department of Labor provided, but uh, we will, should have, I can't remember if it was by April 1st or as of April 1st, but as to whether it'll be Tuesday or Wednesday uh, before we should have that. But. <clears throat> anyway. One of them was no later than. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Hoppick, and I'm at looking at uh, Ms. Fisher again. If we were to create 80 hours of <clears throat> COVID-19 related paid sick leave, that would not um, jeopardize someone applying for unemployment down the road? Natalie Fisher, um, in terms of jeopardizing it, if you were looking at a short term um, 80 hours, it might defer. If, if action was taken following that, it might defer them from, from receiving benefits, but I do not anticipate that just because the employer provided additional leave of some it wouldn't, form, I mean, it would I formally I didn't think jeopardize it would, them. But I just, I'm just thinking of every angle.
Commissioner Ryan, you've been kind of quiet. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I guess I'm <laughs> hard for me to especially to wrap my head around this, but I guess I'm, I'm wondering if uh, who do we hurt, who's injured if we do nothing at all for a week? Mike's Craig, the, I don't know that you injure anyone, but it, employees that are, have been designated as non-essential and they, and they assume that they're going to be off work for a month would be 50 hours sh and they have no leave on the books would be 50 hours short of being able to cover that month of no work. So you, you leave them uncertain in terms of their status. And the stopgap for that is? With is some, combination of, uh, some combination of leave, leave advancement to total 160. So we're back to 160. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay. Explain to me how they're 50 hours short, Commissioner Franz. It, so, if they have no leave accumulated. Yeah, they have, have no leave on the books. The only thing that's available to them is the 110 hours of leave advancement that we authorized okay. last week. All right. Okay. And that's, we thought that's, the, where, that's where you're starting from. Yeah, we okay. thought the 110 combined no. with emergency paid sick leave would get it. So if we uh, did an 80-hour provision here, would we leave the 110 in place that's to get them through the, through the month? Yeah. Yeah, I think you could take it to, well, can we? It was 160, right? Yeah, what we passed last week was 110 for 40-hour employees. Yeah, we we talked about 140, taking it to 200 total. Commissioner Hodges, last, last week's you're resolution doing the was math, 110. So we might have somebody who's already into our leave our advanced leave for 40 hours, right? Um, At this point from, from last week or? Um, well, it really didn't, the non-essential employees today was the first, first day, day that they okay. didn't report. Okay. I, Natalie Fisher, I will clarify, I did receive one request today as a result of a self-quarantine due to travel for the pay period that ended yesterday. So we have one, one sick leave advancement request Pending. But they would qualify for the special leave, right? No, because no. Natalie Fisher, the act makes it effective April 1. So we have the okay. period from March 16th to April until tomorrow. April 1 that is not covered. Okay. It's, it's kind of hard to keep your eye on all the balls. Mm -hmm. you know? Natalie Fisher, again, um, I did find the language in the bill, um, the guidelines not later than 15 days after the date of the enactment of this act. The Secretary of Labor shall provide, and then it explains. So that's two additional. weeks before we may have. Well, the it, effective date was uh, the, the 18th? 18th of March. Oh, okay. So, that's that's how we get so to okay. April yeah, 2nd. the effectiveness of the um, the act shall not be uh, put into place not later than along with the guidance not later than so they didn't give any wiggle room for employers they both are down to the wire so mayor hoppy if we take no action today where do we stand well my my interpretation because Mike's we, Craig, sorry. we made a decision right. last week made right. based on my, correct information that wasn't correct yeah mike's craig and I, i'll acknowledge on the front end yeah. this is a little bit of a creative interpretation but the resolution that was passed last week very clearly said it assumed emergency paid sick leave and stated that we wish to grant to employees up to 110 hours of leave advancement to supplement um, emergency paid sick leave in the event of a stay-at-home order and so we were thinking two thirds and supplement it that way, but if it's zero, I, my interpretation is 110 hours of leave advancement is available to supplement zero, because we really were saying we're going to split two thirds, one third for the first 80 hours. So you're going to get emergency paid sick leave and a little bit of leave advancement, and in that second 
80 hours where you'd used up all the emergency paid sick leave, you're going to use full leave advancement. So I'm, I'm comfortable saying the action you took previously gives me the authority to allow them to take leave advancement, but it's just 110 when they might need 160. I just, Commissioner Hodges, I just keep coming back to my HR for dummies and um, <laughs> um, paying everyone through the end of the month till we till we get this sorted out. And I mean, in terms of it not being equitable, I I get that, and I think that's why I was thinking about the essential employees that are continuing to work and continue to accrue um, all the the time that they would be entitled to. And the non-essential ones, I mean, the clock basically stops. Because at the end of the day, one of the biggest advantages that the essential workers who are working throughout this have is that they are more, much more likely to have a job in another 60 days than the non-essentials are. Because I would imagine the first round of cuts is going to take us through all the non-essential the workers that have been labeled non-essential, I mean, am I wrong on that? <clears throat> that, that would be the first round of cuts is the non-essential uh, staff? I can't say that it wouldn't be. Um, I, Mike's Craig, the, the, the assessment we did for essential non-essential is probably a similar analysis if we find it necessary to reduce force. Uh, Mayor Hoppick, um, so Ms. Fisher, if we were due the 110 hours of leave advancement. Do they have to come to you to ask for that? Natalie Fisher, um, we are working on a web-based form that allows them to elect it electronically. And if they do not elect to receive the leave advancement, what happens to them? Um, We will be working through the supervisors to, I'm going to back up, we're hoping that we provide them through that electronic form something straightforward that they can say, I would like to use this leave or this leave. I want to use my vacation, I want to use my sick leave, or I want to be advanced um, those leave hours so that they have to make an election of some sort or they have the ability to apply for unemployment if they do not wish to leave, to use their leave advancement? That's a question we've been trying to sort out for a couple of days now. So, I, I mean, that's, I guess I'm, yeah. You I mean, know, I, I, Commissioner Franz, I suspect that if we have not terminated the employment relationship. You furloughed them. Well, no. We, they're just on leave. They're just. Yeah. Well, Temporarily not working. Mike's Craig, if I, if, if I could double back again, I, I want to clarify, if, if there's non-essential employees out there listening, we were very aggressive in terms of trying to find a way for them to be at home and not be exposed. So we, we've got employees out there that we've currently said are non-essential that I'm not prepared to say ooh, their function would just not get fulfilled um, going forward. I mean, right. the, it, we have departments that have said, for 30 days, we'll find a way. But long term, that doesn't necessarily mean we could make that work. So I don't, you know, to clarify my answer a little bit, yes, the non-essential essential is, is similar conversation. But as we look at, you know, operations, there's we have some key staff that oh, yeah, when we have to if we had to make decisions between divisions, they they would be pretty key. So. In response to your observation, um, what I don't know is if they if they had left leave on the books and tried to apply for unemployment, whether well, unemployment would would inquire as to you know do you, did did they have leave available to them and make them draw that down first? If we furlough them, that might be a way to you know, make them eligible for unemployment, but. Don't know yet. So then, um, Commissioner Davis, with the people who would qualify for the 39-week full unemployment benefits, that then would imply that they have been separated permanently from their job. 
Well, Mike's Craig, and I understand the reason for the question, but what I'm seeing in terms of the stimulus bill is a recognition that if your hours have been partially or fully reduced, you're eligible for unemployment. And so it's a combination of, you know, I, and I haven't dug into the details, but it appears that if we, if any employer had a non-essential employee that said, you're going to work a half schedule, they, they could draw unemployment for the half of their schedule they lost. And whether it's furlough or whether it's, you know, we, we don't schedule them for 39 weeks and then we schedule them in week 40, I think the intent of that stimulus, as I understand it, would be to try to make unemployment available to them. But the devil's in the details in terms of the regulations and the guidance, which is yet to be produced. Yeah. I feel sorry, Mayor Hoppe here, for those employees sitting out there maybe listening because they're not sure right now. Their, their, their livelihood is at stake. We're sitting here trying to figure out what we're doing for them, and we don't know. I mean, if, if we were to do the 80 hours of emergency paid sick leave and left the 110 hours of leave advancement there, but then we found out that they were furloughed because they were asked to stay home and they could apply for unemployment. And then you had that $600 to help make mm -hmm. them whole. Would, would that be I think sufficient? that's something that we, Mike's Craig, I think that's something that we could further pursue. Uh, and we could factor in the math that you're describing into a furlough decision if if we don't find ourselves in a yeah. scenario where it, it's unavoidable financially for us, yeah. uh, that we still have some options. But at least we give them two weeks and we have that leave advancement. I mean, right. I, I don't want people going to bed tonight not knowing they're going to be paid for a couple weeks. Uh, that, Mike's Craig, I, that, I came into this meeting with that being my yeah. primary concern. And you we, know, we, do, we tried to, to assure them, them that last not, week. And if there's somebody that's working that says that's not fair, life's not fair. Right. You know, and I'm, but we're trying to, you know, we're in unprecedented times, and I think that's the least we could do at this point is to, to try to do the 80 hours of sick leave to, to at least figure out where we're at. Yeah, and but I don't, I'm, and sorry I'm, to just, I'm just looking, but that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. If I can just dovetail a question on this, Commissioner Davis. Is there a uh, block of time during which those, uh, hope I call it by the right name. The emergency sick leave can be used. In other words, could a person exhaust their unemployment benefits because they're on furlough and then on the 40th week come and say, okay, now I want to use that emergency leave? Well, the act is in effect through the end of the year. Um, we probably don't have 30, barely 39 weeks. Natalie Fisher, there are some provisions that talk about um, the length of time someone is employed and how to calculate the wages and going back a number of months. Um, in the event someone is truly not working, um, depending upon when they come back and how that timing plays in, may or may not determine if they, they would be eligible for the emergency paid sick leave or some form of benefit. One other point of clarification. Um, earlier when we talked about creating the leave bank, not just necessarily fronting all the individuals that may not be working right now because of the stay-at-home order, but by creating that bank for all of the individuals that are currently working, that from an equity standpoint, one of the benefits, it would in the future provide someone who's working now that might come down with um, a coronavirus related issue or a family member and would be eligible for that emergency paid sick leave but mm -hmm. if they exhausted that then they would have an additional 80 hours so there still would be some equity that there would be some some benefit to those that are out working even though right now it might not seem like it there would be some security mm -hmm. for them well, in that form of leave through the end of the year and that's the reason i was asking because in some situations if a person on unemployment becomes sick they are then caught under medical disability rules I mean, they're no longer eligible for unemployment because they're not employable at that point mm -hmm. because they're sick you know, so I could see where a person would be hesitant to burn up those 80 hours too early in the, in the game. 
just in case they actually do come down with the virus or some other illness. Mike's Craig, not to complicate it further, but you may recall last week we talked about the act provides for an, an exemption of emergency responders. We have seen some guidance on definition of emergency responder and it's pretty broad, um, extending to public works and city management and things like that. And so we, we identified that as a decision point for you last week, didn't recommend that you take that exemption, but the Secretary of Labor also is granted the authority to exempt emergency responders. So kind of building off what Ms. Fisher was saying, if that 80 hour block is there and emergency responders should get exempted by the Secretary of Labor, it, it'd be available in that scenario as well. Commissioner but, Franz, but again, that only applies to those who qualify under mm -hmm. that form of federal, Correct. federally financed leave. It does not apply to somebody who's just at home because they're non-essential and Correct. we don't have any other way to put them to work. Yeah, the I think everyone that meets the definition of emergency responder, we've called an essential employee and they're working. Um, but Mike Scrigg, uh, back to Mayor Hoppick's point, I, trying to you know find a compromise, find a balance, and uh, come away with a message for employees that the stay-at-home order, you you have an option for you know your paycheck. The ADI either uh, something needs to total at least 160 hours, uh, in my estimation. Um, whether it's 80 hours and and leave the 110, which I, I think you uh, create some cushion, or whether it's 160 hours of advanced leave or 160 hours of paid leave. But for the uncertain employee, their worst case scenario is they have no leave on the books, and we have a few of them, and they are non-essential to the point that they're, they're going to be home for the entirety of the stay-at-home order. Commissioner Davis, so I, I get the impression that we are fortunately all wrestling with the fact that we have a conscience and trying to balance doing the fiscally responsive thing and doing the right thing. Um, and there's no way you can legislate doing the right thing. You either do it or you, or you don't. Uh, you know, if we're in the position where we can afford it, then it makes the discussion even that much harder. Uh, but I'm, I, is there common ground among the plans that we have now? Uh, Commissioner Good. Franz here, for the purposes of discussion and because I'm tired of beating this horse, uh, I will make a motion that for the next 30 days until the end of April, we go ahead and authorize 80 hours of COVID-related leave uh, for non-essential people uh, and that we leave the 110 hours of advancement in place. I believe that is option A. Uh, is, uh, option A basically is presented on, in the blue sheet. Am I correct in that, Mr. Um, Scrag? Yes, and uh, Mike Scrag, if I may, uh, legal counsel Greg Bankson is prepared a resolution trying to get to you uh, know to enact whatever it is that you have in mind. Okay. So if you rather than feeling like you need to make a motion to that level of detail, if you can tell us what uh, if that's the goal. And I think we can distribute the resolution and walk you through that and tell you what amendments might need to be made to the resolution. I'm, I'm fine with that. I just I want us to move. Clarification of the motion maker was that just for non essential employees? Did I hear that correct? I presume if they're essential, they're not going to be on. Leave. Uh, Mayor Hopp, but I believe if, if they would fall under this, if somebody is required to be quarantined or something, then they would fall under this. Would that be correct? They would then fall under the federal emergency leave provisions. Yeah, the, okay. yeah. There, there might be just a few circumstances where yeah. they don't meet the federal regulations where they might be able to take advantage of well, it. Well, I don't want anybody to fall into a hole, so let's cover that if we okay. can. Okay. Him. I don't I know, think does that you clarify <laughs> your question, Commissioner? Thank you, yes. Commissioner. Da well, I, I don't I know, know what the hole might be, but it, you know, I don't it, want to create a position where we have somebody two, who is, somebody gets it, it, yeah. Mike Craig, the, the most likely hole that I can see is symptomatic enough to cause concern that you're an essential employee, but we don't want you, you know, putting your other uh, employees at risk. But you haven't risen to a quarantine order. You haven't got a medical diagnosis. This would at least cover that 
possibility. You know, I think if they're symptomatic, they they fit the bill. Yeah, uh, we've talked about that we, as well. We don't want them coming to work. Well, yes. whether it's symptomatic, you know. you know, one of the things we're running into is I wasn't directly exposed, but my spouse was thinks they yeah. might have been exposed and so now do you want me to come to work or don't you my child thinks they might have hung with another child whose dad was exposed um, yeah, uh, Mr. Procedural Brixton, do you have a document there for us to pass around well, we should not do, second do I need a second the, <laughs> or are we or do, to will we make the second we'll make the motion off of the the document you have that I expected to be how you might okay. want to proceed okay. yeah. so mm -hmm. if it's useful I think Mr. Bankston can present the resolution mm -hmm. and speak to this, the format that you proposed of what might need to be amended. And if you uh, collectively want to amend it differently, we'll help you with that as well. Mayor Hoppick here. Great. Uh, Mr. Bankston, would you happen to have copies of that for us to follow along with? Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> okay. um, but I wanted to be sure we handled the distribution in a manner that you would find appropriate under the circumstances. I wonder if it would be easiest. If I just stepped away and you all each had an opportunity to pick up, rather than appro I don't want to approach no. all of you. So if that sounds okay. appropriate, I can step away and that is the stack of okay. uh, copies. <laughs> <laughs> You will recognize uh, several of the provisions. Um, tried to this, as you can see, is intended to be a an amendment and a restatement, if you will, of uh, the resolution you considered previously. Um, I don't know if Shandy knows offhand what the number will be, but uh, we can uh, take care of that. The first uh, four. Well, let's put it this way, on the res on, you'll see on the whereas is I approach them a little bit more like recitals. Uh, there are three pages of recitals, but the intent was to try uh, as best we can to address this whole big picture uh, by inventorying basically the uh, benefits, the leave benefits that city employees receive by virtue of uh, the city uh, and the introduction of the two forms of leave that we know have come with uh, the recent act. Uh, so, as I say, the first four, A through uh, D, you'll recognize as having been in your previous resolution. E and F address the actions by the Saline County Health Officer and by Governor Kelly with regard to the stay-at-home orders. Uh, G then refers to the vacation leave that employees accrue. H, the sick leave benefits and how those are currently allowed to be used. Uh, then the point under I is it's not an additional leave, but there is provision under the personnel policy for emergency leave in terms of the potential for, to utilize either vacation or personal leave uh, under a circumstance that is is not addressed by the uh, sick leave. There is the uh, personal day that accrues uh, under the personnel manual. It's under the uh, holiday section. K uh, addresses the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act under the federal law. The uh, L then addresses the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act 
uh, which I've referred to as emergency FMLA leave. It describes that very basically. Uh, M simply refers to the current state of the matter where we have legislation, interpretive guidance to be provided, and of course the prospect for further orders. N then sets out uh, what may or may not be your desire, but uh, in terms of approaching the authorization, the potential authorization of utilization for sick leave uh, by employees subject to a stay at home order, uh, temporarily providing full time employees with what I've referred to as uh, COVID related paid leave, and uh, the temporary uh, form of advanced leave consistent with what you had approved last week. That finally gets us to the resolution. Uh, you'll recognize the two elements of uh, in section one, both the ratification of the city manager's prior authorization of the use of sick leave for child care related absences and uh, further authorizing the use of sick leave for any COVID related absences, including but not limited to the state or local stay at home order. Section two was uh, previously part of your prior uh, resolution. It appeared a little bit later with that process having been uh, leading a lot of what the rest of this uh, provides, it was elevated there to section two. Section three uh, is where we speak of the potential for the granting of the full-time employees 80 hours for uh, use in relation to COVID-related absences. When grading my paper as we were waiting out in the hall, uh, Ms. Fisher astutely pointed out that it's hard to do something retroactive to April 16, uh, 2020, <laughs> that that should be March 16, 2020. I was about to ask. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, in any event, that we then go on to describe as best we, as I, the attempt was to address how the city manager would be authorized to administer that additional uh, leave uh, determined by the city manager to be COVID-19 related absences. Uh, we also wanted to assure the lawful utilization of the emergency paid sick leave and emergency FMLA leave when applicable. Uh, utilize it in concert with the other leaves that are uh, available under the city's policies as determined by the city manager. And then uh, the enhancement of the potential for preservation of the employee's base rate of compensation due to COVID related orders, restrictions, or now modified work schedules, working conditions, and or job assignments that present, prevent an employee from otherwise performing the employee's regular duties as regularly scheduled. You'll recognize then in section four, uh, the reference to the potential for the COVID leave advancement. Uh, it is basically uh, along the line of what you had authorized before. It uh, disconnects it with the, from the federal act to the extent that it could potentially uh, integrate or relate to the use of the other city forms of leave uh, and if applicable, the federal uh, leaves that are provided under the new act. The, um, we'll want to address specifically the number of hours, uh, both in the reference to section four, if it's your choice to go forward with that concept, and then that same number would carry over to the last line of section five, where we talk about the potential under uh, unique circumstances where the city manager could grant additional advance leave if warranted. Uh, section six, again, you'll recognize as being part of your prior resolution. Uh, similarly, section seven, uh, section eight, again, is 
a restatement of what was in the prior resolution. Same with section nine, section 10, uh, and a modified section 11 with uh, certain of the updates that we now have. Mayor Hoppick, a quick question on this. It's, and I know it's not a big deal, but why were we discussing 110 and then this has 120? Yeah, Mike's Craig, I'll take responsibility for that one. Um, as we were discussing it, I, I work from the assumption that if we granted the 80 and the 120 would create, cover a month off and leave an additional 40. But it, in 110 was what we provide, what we approved last week. So. I, I I asked Greg to round it up to the 120 to get to a month plus one week. I just thought the 110 was a kind of a strange number, but I didn't know what that came yeah. from. That was the, the two-thirds the math with okay. emergency paid sick okay. leave that no longer applies. Okay. Is 120 is a month plus one week. 120 plus the, the 80. 80 makes, okay. Yeah. Sometimes I'm a little slow. Well, I didn't articulate that very well. Any, I'll, I'll admit. any questions for Mr. Bingston? Yep. Uh, Commissioner Franz, this is set to expire December 31st. Yes. Uh, I presume that since the hours are limited, it really doesn't make much difference if it's the end of April or the end of December. I was thinking about this as a 30-day stopgap mm -hmm. until we could... You know. uh, the the year end approach is what we did last week, um, okay. but yeah, it could it certainly could be a shorter duration. Well, some long range planning until facts or situations suggest that we need to alter the course. I mean, Mayor Hoppe here, I guess the maybe Commissioner Franz is getting at the fact if we find that. Unemployment with plus the six hundred dollars would would be better. They wouldn't have to take their leave. Is that what you're getting at? Well, I'm. I was just thinking this was sort of a stopgap to get us through the immediate circumstance, and not for the rest of the year. But as uh, long as there's an hours cap, I guess it really doesn't make a lot of difference. Yeah, we last week we tried to mirror the family's first provisions that took it to the end of the year, okay. but it certainly could be a shorter duration. Any Commissioner other? Davis, I, I would assume if a person's take home is going to be roughly the same on unemployment as using ad leave advancement, they'd rather use the unemployment. I would think just so that they wouldn't owe you know be down in the hole. A month's worth of leave. Um, Commissioner Franz again, and I, I, I'm having trouble getting my head out of the way things were, but typically if somebody gets unemployment, they don't have access to leave anymore. Mm -hmm. Because Mike's they're Craig, not employed. You're, right, you're, Mike's crazy. You know, I, I just, I, I don't understand how that well, relates. is there a difference between unemployment and furlough? Right. Well, between it, being laid off and furlough, and I don't right. know enough about the furlough circumstances and apparently Ms. Fisher doesn't either, <laughs> to really address that. So we may be talking yeah. about a, a hypothetical situation okay. that, you know. But, uh, Mike's uh, Craig here. Part of our conversation was as, as we ask employees to elect, is it even plausible to have them elect to be you? furloughed. Uh, I don't know if that qualifies as a furlough anymore, well, but those are the kind of things we're going to have to sort out. Um, yeah. And you know, I think if, if you know if you look at other employers and other circumstances that have a need for reduction in force and they take volunteers to retire early, you might if we identify furloughing, we might be able to take volunteers to be furloughed. Um, but uh, yeah, those are details that we haven't got sorted out yet. Okay, I think that's kind of separate from this issue. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, do I need to restate my motion um, before we do that? Let's check to see if there's anybody on the on the phone. That's all right. I just thought of that. So. That's a good point. We we currently only have five callers. Um, 
And uh, let me restate in case anyone's listening. It, it, the the screen timed out, and I just want to make sure that it didn't affect anyone. So if anyone listening wants to call in, I'm going to read the numbers that you need to call. You would first need to dial in to a 785-621-0800. You then would need to enter a participant ID of 782-956. You'll then be prompted to announce yourself, followed by the number sign or hash sign, and then until you finish that announcement and hash sign, you're not joined into the call. I want to give it just a little bit. And while um, we're doing that, I would ask the city clerk, do you have a resolution number for us? Uh, yes, it'll be 20-7825. 25, thank you. Mm-hmm. Mayor, if I may, it's... Yes. An appropriate time, uh, Greg Vinkson, legal counsel, a couple of points of clarification that I need to ask about. No, no callers? Not yet. Okay, no. we'll go ahead, Mr. Binkson. Um, in the same line as the incorrect reference to April appears on Section 3 instead of March, uh, Commissioner Davis's comment a question earlier uh, prompted me to wonder if we anticipate continuing with the ending date of December 31, 2020. Uh, <clears throat> the point about carryover or cash value prompted me to uh, suggest we might possibly want to complete that sentence after December 21, or I'm sorry, after it says December 31, 2020, to add without carryover and without cash value, if that clarifies that point. Would that then just apply to the expiration of this type of enactment uh, and not someone who chose to leave before then? Hmm. Commissioner Franz, by the way. Do you, does that make sense to you, the question? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> If I, if I am covered by this, if I'm an employee and I'm covered by this, and I choose to leave May 31st, and I've still got my 80 hours of COVID leave that I have not used, can I draw that down in cash value? Or does your restriction on cash value apply to any date of separation and not just the expiration of this piece of legislation? That is a good point, and I think that's a matter of what the policy intent is, I expect that it is, well, I don't know. Well, I, I pre presume our intent would be not to have this count towards cash value upon separation. I'm just questioning if, if you put the language where you say, you, where, it, where you've proposed, if that calls that into question. It's a, it's a good point. And it, you know, I wonder if there's, it's not worth just a separate well, you, sentence. Your actual term of phrase might might work. N number one, I'm looking at the Mike's Craig. I'm looking at the personnel manual, and in terms of buyback, it it speaks specifically to vacation buyback, and then it speaks to uh, sick leave. So it, it it doesn't it doesn't speak broadly in terms of leave across the board. Okay. But just to be safe, so I think what we COVID could, 19 terminology would keep it. Yeah. Separated. Well, but I think uh, to be even more abundantly clear, it could be without carryover um, and without cash value upon separation. Okay. And, and at that point, it, regardless of time, at the point okay. you separate it, it has no cash value. Okay. And the only other question I had uh, there is no specific time frame presently addressed in this draft as it relates to the uh, advanced leave. Sorry, say that again, please. When you There's go to no. section four, where we're talking mm -hmm. about the granting of the... Uh, 120 hours. Right, the 120 mm -hmm. hours of what we've called COVID-19 leave advancement. Should that there is not a specific time frame addressed in the resolution. 
Mayor Hoppick here. Should that tie into the December 30th also? Well, that's what I prompted think, my question. I mean, I, I, I guess I interpret it to be that way. So if we need to add that language, I would. Well, that the 120 hours would have to be used by December 30th. So you don't go in December 30th and say, I want to start my 120 hours right. now. Uh, that clarification would be helpful. The the balance would carry on beyond December 31st. Uh, I think right. that's the question. But no, the the if you have been advanced leave, your ba your balance oh, to be repaid the, could yeah, carry okay. on past year end. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's worth clarifying if you have a suggested wording. I will leave that to the gentleman that created the document. I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the detail, uh, Greg Bingston, legal counsel. The detail that would seem to be significant in that, I think, is if there is a point in time that any such request would need to be made in anticipation of year end or if the example of a request at year end yeah well, although if a person truly became sick with the virus on December 29th through no fault of their own you know the question is well you you did get sick before the year end, I mean, do you give them the 120 hours or do you say, well, you're only going to get three days worth? That, that, that's a policy decision for you as a governing body. Right we do Christmas. now have a caller that <laughs> wants to speak. Um, I, you raise a good point, Commissioner Davis, and I think as a governing body, if you want to provide us direction, then we can try to word it accordingly. Um, uh, 120 hours is three weeks. Half, yeah. So. Uh, I guess it's December. It's Commissioner Davis, it's December. cleaner if everything ends on the same day, although probably between now and December, we will know if there's a compelling reason to renew this next year or extend it in some form or fashion or, or, or modify it. I've been, and I think, hope the air is a little clearer by then. And um, in some respects, it might be easier just have it have the ability to request the leave expire at the end of the year. And if we find ourselves in a situation where we have that really leave request overlapping, if they truly right. have a circumstance, we can accommodate it. Probably the nicer thing to do, I guess. For you. Well, uh, Mr. Bingston is working on that language. Do we want to take our caller? We can. Okay. Um, I'm going to unmute the phone for a caller whose number ends in 2668. So it is unmuted. If, you, if you're calling in and wish to speak, 2668. Hello? Yes. 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 Uh, yes, I was going back to uh, the motion that they were talking about, possibly looking uh, at the two weeks revisiting it. Because um, right now it sounds like there's a whole lot of unknowns with the stimulus package and the uncertainties that come into that. Why don't we revisit it in two weeks when we actually have some answers because there's a whole lot of I don't know. Yeah. Um, the, uh, Mike Craig, city manager, I, I understand your point. I don't want to hold out too much hope we'll know an, uh, more in two weeks. And I think part of the conversation was just uh, wanting the employees to have some sense of what option is, that they have some option available to them during the month long stay at home order. Um, Commissioner Hodges uh, here, if I yeah. could. Yeah, because uh, as a city of employee, I'm in one of those limbos where I get put 
unessential, and then I'm supposedly going to be partially laid off slash furloughed, whatever the decision on that is. And right now it's seemingly super unclear to anybody else that's watching that what our options will truly be because there are, you know, six different things on the table. Right. This is Mike Scrag again. I think the proposed, the, what, what's being discussed, at least provides more certainty for the next 30 days than a two-week approach might. Okay. Because that was that was just my my curiosity is is like I said, as an employee that doesn't know, we're trying to to fit everybody in, which it's a much more complicated subject than essential, non-essential. Because there's there's that whole gray area. Sure. And it just seems like as an employee, we feel I feel like we'd be indebted to the city at that point. Um, but uh, Mike's Craig again. And the currently, yeah, I don't know that you've ever had to use it, but we currently have an approach where. We will advance leave, and it does create a, a leave balance to be repaid, and so there is a, uh, an indebtedness, to use your word there. This approach would kind of split that in half with 80 hours of paid leave that is unique to COVID-19, and then an additional uh, bank of leave that could be drawn upon in advance, similar to what the approach that's on the books today. So to clarify, the, we would have the, the current 80 hours, which I was to understand is a two-third plus this 80 hours of COVID-19 on top of that. Yeah, I, Mike's Craig, I completely understand the question. Um, that was the conversation last week it's based on what we're now seeing is the interpretation of that emergency paid sick leave. What we're doing is creating 80 hours of City of Salina paid COVID-19 leave that would be available to employees to draw upon without having to repay that. And then beyond that initial 80, they could advance another 120 if that's the ultimate um, decision that's made by the governing body. So in, the, in this scenario, the 80 it would be provided by the city and the two thirds, one third um, wouldn't apply in a stay at home situation. Um, you, if if the act, if there was a different circumstance that made it subject to the act, we would have to sort that out. There's six different criteria for the act, but a stay-at-home order is not one of them. Um, okay. Ma Mayor Hoppick here. One of the things, if you've been listening, that um, we're we're hoping, and, and again, there's a lot of uh, what ifs right now. Is we're we're hoping that as we look at that stimulus program. And there's some unemployment benefits in there. That there's some things in there that maybe will be able to help you, um, and you wouldn't have to use the, uh, the advancing the uh, of you know your sick leave. We're hoping that there's something within that um, stimulus package that's going to be beneficial to to you also. Okay. Yeah, because that was that was the main concern after that initial 80 hours right because right. initially we were to understand 80 hours then sick leave and vacation and all that to supplement because we at that point did not have um, anything else set into stone but now we're recommending if we don't want to take the 110 120 hour discussion then we could go into that unemployment I, status, possibly, depending on the Possibly, yes. Nice. We're not 100% sure, but possibly that's a, there. there's discussion of that, and then there's a discussion of there's some other dollars to help supplement that um, for the employee. So I apologize that we're talking about things we don't really completely know at this point. We're still trying to figure it out. It's Commissioner Davis, although you seem to have a pretty good grasp of, uh, of I mean, which order you would take your leave. Which is yeah. good. I, I cut Commissioner Hodges off earlier. Oh, um, and, and Commissioner Hodges here. I um, I just keep coming back, and something that the, the the caller mentioned 
I get that we are sitting here tonight and we have an urge to do something, to get something done for our employees and to provide them with some reassurance in the, in the weeks ahead. But right now, there are so many questions that we don't have answers to. And I've been you know, sitting here for the last 30, 40 minutes and it's just like, everybody's got these great questions and we just don't have any answers for them at this point. So, um, you, I, I, for, for, forgive um, my frustration, but what I don't want to do is act too hastily tonight because we are basically we're spitballing with people's lives um, and their livelihoods and their and, and, and their family security and um, we don't know how this how any federal aid is going to be administered um, we don't know about the programs or the guide the you know anything beyond the most rudimentary um, guidelines and I, I guess I just don't understand the reservations among senior staff and the governing body to just saying, let's take a time out until when does um, the stay at home order expire? Wednesday, April 29th. Let's keep everybody whole. Let's pay everybody and see what happens. I agree with Commissioner France. We, we, th th this is, I mean, it's a luxury to be able to try to, um, to, to take care of our, of our employees. But I mean, our employees are what hopefully creates the value in our organization. And I would, I'd, instead of, you know, maybe returning to this next week and the week after and the week after and making adjustments, I'd love to just be able to say, we've got your back through the end of, of April and we're going to do our due diligence in sorting through what's probably going to be massively complicated and figuring out what is the best way um, to leave you whole acknowledging that we have got some absolutely horrific cuts that we're probably going to be making in the next two or three months. But I guess that's, that's why I'm having a real hard time supporting this. I've just got so, there's so many questions that, that have been raised. Uh, if so, I could hey, say something, this is Commissioner Franz. So I think you are describing line. precisely what we're trying to do is we're trying to make them whole through at least the next 30 days. They'll have the 80 hours, they have any leave they have accumulated, they have 120 now that they can pull in advance. That's a total of five weeks that any employee has access to um, over the next 30 days. Uh, and I think that's what we're doing. And in, in April 30th, May 2nd, whenever we meet again at that point, maybe before, as things fall into place and as the pandemic proceeds and we can see where we are, we can come in and modify this again. We can take other actions, but this is intended to provide security for that period of time and maybe longer. I mean, I, I don't know. So I, I think we are doing precisely what you're saying we should do. Um, and Commissioner Hodges here, and, and, and I get that. I think that where I have the um, where I have the, 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 the problem is, like I said before, breaking it down in terms of um, leave advancement. And I think that the caller spoke to that too about you know, basically going in debt to, you know, and, um, to having you know, uh, taken more time off than you've uh, accrued. And I guess I, I'm fine with all of this, I just really have a hard time stomaching the whole um, leave advancement um, in terms of that, and 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 that's just. But we did the leave advancement last week. I know, and I've had, and you and know. I wasn't, ha I wasn't, I, I I didn't like it. And I voted for it last week, and I'm just, I it's. Before we got, we still we, we still have a call on. Do you have any other comments? I apologize. We got little. Key. In oh, the sorry. conversation the there. Still on. Um, no, I'm at this point. Uh, I mean, I know that you guys are trying to look out for everybody and stuff. It's just it's a complicated matter on your part financially, um, and doing the right thing. And we get that. We just we're wanting to know how our family is going to get supported at the end of the day. And. That's kind of kind of where we are sitting is with the 
that not knowing of the stimulus package, where I see uh, Commissioner Franz's point, um, but yet again, as an employee, I do feel if I'm forced into that 110, 120 hours, that I'm never going to work my way out of it. Because that would mean I'd get no vacation for like two years, like at all, unless I paid that off over five years or something like that. This is Commissioner Davis, you know, this is not going to sound kind, but it, you know, any other financial calamity that might, you know, come any of our ways, you know, we could be in the same situation. Um, you know, where you need a big loan, you you borrow and, and you don't buy a car, you don't go to the movies until that loan's paid off. Um, the the responsibility for keeping employees hold has been shifted to the employer. And uh, very often the employer is, is, is in the same situation as the employee. I mean, you know, that, that money is only going to last but for so long. So it's an attempt to, it's a short-term fix. Uh, if, we're in this same, if we're in dire straits for 12 months, everybody's up the creek. Uh, you know, there are no safe jobs at that point. Uh, you know, so it's an attempt, you know, to keep people whole for, for a month um, with options. I mean, the federal government's <laughs> going to give options whether we give some or not because we'd be mandated to offer certain types of leave. Uh, but, you know, to advance leave it would be an option. Obviously, another option is get another job or if, if the rules allow them, go on unemployment. Uh, if, if you're not working, uh, but I think we can only operate from the position of being responsible. We're not responsible for this pandemic, you know. I hope none of us are. Uh, but you know, we're we're thrust in the situation of trying to keep 600 people whole, which is not an easy task. I'd like to thank the caller for calling in. We we definitely appreciate your comments. Thank you for your time. Um, if, I, if I can double back, um, Mike's Craig, the, the desire to tell employees we have their back for 30 days, I don't think we can tell them that without taking some additional action this evening. You as a governing body have the discretion to decide what that is, but the, with the emergency paid sick leave not being a good fit for stay at home, I don't think we can make that assertion without additional action this evening. I'm sorry, I don't understand. What what additional action? Uh, to, to be determined, but yeah. uh, what right. the action you took last week right. leaves them with 110 hours of leave advancement, which won't cover a full month. Mayor Hoppick here. I, I'm I'm going to say my piece. I'm kind of in between here. I think um, what we we need to try to take care of the employee, which I think we're doing by at least doing the the 80 days of sick leave or of uh, 80 hours. 80 hours. I'm yeah. sorry. Did I say 80 days? <laughs> yes. Yeah, they're going to really <laughs> like me, aren't they? 80 hours, <laughs> which hopefully gives us time to 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 figure out what that what other options that employee has. Um, again, as an employer, I have the option to do with my employees what I want. Um, as a commissioner here. I work for the city of Salina, and I have individuals, and, and I, I, I understand where Commissioner Hodges is coming from and saying, you know, let's just pay him for 30 days. Well, there's a lot of individuals out there that have been laid off, and their employers are not giving them 30 days of, of pay. And I think some of those people would be looking at us saying, well, wow, that's nice that the city gave everybody 30 days, and I'm on unemployment from day one. I think this is a compromise. I think this is telling our employees of the city, you're important to us. We're going to we're going to give you 80 hours and we're going to figure out where we go from there. We've also given the opportunity to 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 go into that that bank of 120 hours. So, I think it's a compromise. Um, I'm not sure what else we can do and be not only we have to be fair to the employees, but we also have to be fair to the taxpayers too. And some of those taxpayers now are not are unemployed, so that's that's where I come from. 
Commissioner Franz here, I need to inquire of Mr. Bankston if he understands what we want this to say with the amendments that you suggested and we've suggested. Have we resolved all of those technical issues? This is Greg Bingston, Legal Counsel. The one question that I still have a blank on is, uh, well, speaking of the uh, COVID-19 leave advancement, I would think very possibly the same language as to the effective affected time period, if I'm correct, that we may have need for some retroactive application such that the same language that you see in Section 3 as it related to the COVID-19 paid leave, the effective retroactively to March 16, 2020 and ending December 31, 2020, yes. <clears throat> would be inserted there in line 3 of Section 4 right after leave advancement. So it would read, leave advancement, close quote, effective retroactively to March 16, 2020 and ending December 31, 2020 and continue for use upon the election of the employee. Um, <clears throat> the blank that I had is the lead in as to when you would expect those requests to have been made uh, such that it would be until blank the city manager is authorized to grant full-time employees, so on and so forth. Could we not just specify the equivalent of 120 hours before December 31st? Or, Mayor Hoppecker, I, I think Mayor Davis made the comment, if, if we don't know how long this is going to go on, if, I'm, if I have a COVID-19 episode in November, am I not due my 100 or do my chance to have the 120 days? Hours. Uh, hours. God, yeah. 10 days, man. <laughs> 120 hours. It's getting late in the night. Yeah. No matter so, when it expires. No matter, yeah, I think as long as you apply, I think, yeah, I would think I, I as long that. as you apply for it prior to December 30th or 31st, I guess okay. it is, you'd be okay. Commissioner. Because I'm guessing that we'd have something new in 2021 if, if this is continuing. Commissioner Franz, I would just like to point, make the point that if you have a COVID-19 episode, then you probably qualify for the federal emergency leave provisions. I would defer think. To. I will defer to yeah, Ms. Know. Fisher. <laughs> you Mr. you do at possibly a two-thirds rate, and then if we're trying to supplement the two-thirds with leave advancement. You may not need the 120 hours, but you might need some leave advancement. But wouldn't you fall under the federal rules then and not the city rules? Well, but <laughs> you would, but... Except for changing Except for all the this leave advancement, well, we're trying yeah. to give you okay. the opportunity to marry it. the leave advancement with the federal rules. Um. Commissioner Hodges, I had just have one one final question. Okay, so let's say I'm a non-essential employee. I use up my 80 hours. I I exhaust. I I go through the advancing of leave, et cetera, et cetera, and I'm not called back to work. So at that point, I separate from the organization and I assume I ap apply for unemployment. Let's say in a year or so, and obviously the city is going to absorb the cost of the leave that was advanced, correct? I mean, we're not going to, or I mean, we can't like retroactively go back and, and garnish someone for that, right? And then what happens if in a year that person who say has a skill set that we need, need um, applies for a job with the city? I mean, does that deficit stay with them when they rejoin the organization? Is that a permanent disqualifier? What, what does that look like? Natalie Fisher, um, <coughs> we made revisions a few years ago that allow us to um, have an agreement where the employee says, in the event I leave employee prior to my balance being repaid, um, the remaining balance 
is an allowable deduction, and if there's not enough to cover it, then the city will invoice me. Since that time, we have not had um, someone leave our employee with a negative balance. Um, we've also not had anything of this magnitude impact the number of employees that we're potentially impacting. So I think that would be a further policy question that we would need answered on how we would handle that. But currently, the, the agreement that they sign, and that will be built in to the forms that they apply a digital signature to that acknowledges that exact same language that I just mentioned, an allowable deduction if they would leave employee, and if uh, there's not enough to deduct, then it would result in the form of an invoice to the individual. So yeah, we would be invoicing people for 120, the 120 hours that we advanced them if they did not return to our, if, if they were laid off or, or permanently furloughed or whatever, we would be invoicing them for that? That's our current approach. Practically speaking, if that invoice is unpaid, I don't know that we have a remedy. And the, you know, the leave advancement up to 120 hours, I would hope for anyone will be their last resort, uh, you know, with, with the other. Uh, but, you know, uh, desperation can hit any of us. And, you know, what will be important to people at that moment is getting what they need that week. And they're not going to really worry about being, what is that, 15 days in the hole? To get Commissioner the Franz map. here, uh, I would suggest that in the interest of getting the employees covered over the next 30 days, that we proceed with this as it's written and defer that issue until we know more about some of the other parameters we're going to have to deal with. I agree. Uh, if nothing else, we can do a sunset on this legislation and say we're going to reconsider this in September or something. Uh, because it's it. I mean, we need, we need to get, move forward here, uh, and I am sure that if we work at it, we could be here until two in the morning, st asking questions we don't know the answers to. But let's let's get the employees covered as best we can, and then see what transpires in the next several weeks, and and we can revisit we'll this that. again at that point. Good point. I, I, you know, I, Mr. I, Bingston, do you have some dish? Do you have some language there? Or are we ready to accept a motion for the resolution? Uh, Greg Bingston, legal counsel. I wasn't sure if we came in for a landing on when the request or when you would be, when the city manager would be authorized to grant the leave advancement. Uh, I don't know if that's more a function of the end of the pay period and the time necessary in advance of that mm -hmm. to address it uh, prior to year end or uh, uh, Mike Greg here on the assumption that the request comes in and it's granted it potentially is going to span beyond the end of a pay period anyway I think I think if, you, if the city commission wish, wishes to pick a date the, as Mr. Bankston proposed then it would give the city manager the authority to approve up to 120 hours right up to that expiration date and that 120 hours could extend beyond the you know if you say uh, until 1231 of 20 the city manager is authorized then I could receive a I could approve a request on 1231 of 20 for 120 hours which would extend beyond New Year's. Commissioner Franz here I will accept that because I don't think that will ever happen. Yeah. We will have a different resolution to this mm -hmm. by the time we get there. Mm -hmm. I'm, that's, I'm fine that's, with that. That's, yeah. that's essentially what yeah. I think is going to happen. And if it doesn't happen naturally, we can make it happen and we can resolve if that's a problem. So I, I would accept that just to get it off the table. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Greg Bankson, legal counsel. Am I correct then, Mr. Scragg, that use of that date would eliminate the need for any reference to a commencement or termination date that it would 
we're past the commencement date of that March. I mean, we're already in April. So I don't even know if you need an extension. Strictly as it relates to Section 4. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, I was back on Section no, 3. No, no. Yes. No. Yep. If that being because, a case. Because under Section 4, we have that commencement date, but we're already past that. We're already going to do the mm -hmm. 80 days of Could. COVID. So we shouldn't need a commencement date, should we? Or uh, just unless today? we need to acknowledge the possibility of retroactivity back to March 16th. See, the commencement date is retroactive. So they're going to look back at somebody who was may have been in this circumstance mm -hmm. a week ago and have it apply to them. That's why we need the commencement date. Yes. Would we know that by now? Okay. And I think we can do that with right, just, okay. just with fine. the commencement date. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. If I may, then, I, as I understand, uh, based on our discussion, if you look to Section 3, Line four would read effective retroactively to March 16, 2020 and ending December 31, 2020 without carryover and without cash value upon separation. Correct. If we look to section four, it would begin that until December 31, 2020, the city manager is authorized. Um, and then in line three, following reference to leave advancement, close quote, there would be inserted retroactively or effective retroactively to March 16, 2020. And then continue as it presently reads for use upon the election of the employee. Is everyone okay with that language? Yes. With that, I would accept a motion to approve the resolution. I would make said motion. I was about to ask the clerk to read it back to us, but I'm sure she's <laughs> as confused as we all are. <laughs> I, I would. Uh, I, I move that we uh, uh, adopt resolution number 20-7825. Um, amending, restating, and repealing resolution number 207822, addressing temporary personnel measures in response to the COVID-19 public health emergency. Commissioner Davis, second. Okay. We have a motion to approve resolution number 20-7825 with the um, changes per the city commission. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Okay, that passes four to one. Okay, do we have any other business? Just two little short things. Okay. These will be relatively fun, actually. And all this, I guess on March 12th, I was not going through my mail and got my census form. I hadn't responded, so March 16th, I got a second one. Uh, but don't forget, even despite all this, it is time to, uh, I guess Wednesday would be the official official day, but they'd like the online ones done by Wednesday. That's how they determine who to send the paper forms at. So don't forget that. And I'd just like to thank uh, Kansas Gas Crew Leader Chris for being a true first responder to my house when a bulldozer met our gas line. Uh, but uh, mm. none, of, none of my neighbors had to sleep outside that night, or me. Uh, but it uh, takes a lot, of, a lot of nerve to go running towards a uh, gas line uh, that you can hear hissing from <laughs> 100 feet away. But uh, job well done wherever you are. Thank you. And I would say I completed my census form today. And it was easy. All right. And, and to that to that end, I did it online, and it took literally two minutes. It was yeah. super easy to do. So we want everyone to remember that means dollars to our community. So it's important that we do that. So, so. Okay. With that, I accept a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, guys. Thank you, staff, for all your work. Mr. Bingston. Thank you.